This is Cathedral Hill in Downpatrick, one of the most sacred sites in Ireland. The place where, according to legend, St Patrick built a monastery and was later buried. Are there any traces of those early monastic buildings on this hill? Are they lying buried somewhere here under 1,500 years of some of Ireland's most fascinating history? Time Team have got just three days to peel back the layers and find out. Presumably this church is pretty modern. Well, most of what you see is an 18th century rebuild of the medieval abbey that was here, that was founded in the 12th century, and, and some of the buildings actually 13th century. But that actually might be a clue you see, Tony, because you can see the rather strange site where it's on the flat there, and then it sort of drops Slopes down away. this end. You can see this line here, yeah, the which is sort of course. parallel yeah, yeah. with the ground here, and then the line carries on there, but the yeah. ground just slopes away. I mean, you wouldn't build like that because you'd go for the top of the hill. Uh, you wouldn't project out like this unless there was some reason why you couldn't build on the top. You know, perhaps there was some earlier structure there that you were trying to avoid when you built this church. Which might have something to do with St. Patrick. Yeah, I mean, St. Patrick's 5th century. Uh, this is 12th onwards, so there's a long period of the early Christian period when this might have been respecting something that was plonked on top of the hill. So what's all this then? This is another clue to the early importance of the top of the hill, the the which Peter can show you on this, this plan that he's got here. What have you got there? Yeah, this is a plan of 1799, which I came across last year. And if you take that as being the corner of the cathedral, the corner is repeated here. And on the basis of that, we can locate a round tower, which was taken down in 1790. And what we're trying to do here is we're, we're mapping out the exact location of the round tower, hoping to go and find it. So what were these round towers? These round towers, they rose up to a height of about 70 feet. Uh, and they're called Tligchach uh, in Old Irish, which means <laughs> literally a, a bell house or a bell yeah, tower. Yeah. And presumably the, the monks would have gone up uh, the tower and rung the bells um, out of the top windows. Uh, and what of the sort tower. of date is it? Probably about uh, 10th, 11th century or thereabouts. So it isn't anything to do with St Patrick? No, but they are an indicator of an early site because they tend to be in the middle of the centre of the complex where the church... Come and have a look at what Victor's drawing. You'll see the, the sort of context of them. So this is just like an, a, a tower on its own yeah. stuck in the middle of the landscape. Here we are, look. You see, Victor's done a drawing of what it might have looked like in the 10th century. So we're up on the top of the hill, and we've got our high crosses and our churches, and there's the, the bell tower in the middle of the early complex of buildings there. So how does that help us as far as 500 years earlier is concerned, when St Patrick was around? Well, I think that, the, that this drawing shows you the monastery as it would have been in the 10th century with the round tower next to the church, which is almost certainly on the site of the church which would have gone back to the time of St. Patrick. Right, so we're looking for the remains of a bell tower. If we can find it, then it will confirm that this was the centre of an early Christian monastery, and other buildings which predate the bell tower might be close by. This flat field next to the cathedral occupies a large amount of the top of the hill and ought to have been a good place to build. This is the first target area for geophysics. Archive photos show that this field was the site of tennis courts around 1914, but hopefully they didn't scrape away all the archaeology when they built them. You probably think so. Yeah, we really think we have, Tony. Well, oh, it's just right on the track. It's line. just, yeah, packing, uh, picking my way back through this sort of makeup for the car park. And then all of a sudden, we're into really big stones. And look, look at these voids. Look, look, it goes right the way down in there. And look, the chalk line absolutely slap bang on the line. Now, is that a coincidence or what? And it's coming along. You can see here, this is very, very hard and compacted. And then here, 
really big stones again. Presumably that's rubble filling a, a rubber trench up there, is it? Well, possibly. Solid or, or Nick was saying, it, it, it may just be part of a, a rubble foundation or something like ah, that. Ah, right. I mean, this is like rock solid. And I think you'll find that there are also big stones underneath here yeah. as well. That's the sort of size of stone there. they build with. Look, listen to that. Well, listen to that. It's hollow, isn't it? The bell tower was still standing till the 1790s and was drawn by several artists. So this is 1789 That's right. and you've got your round tower in the corner. Come look at the other one again. Now the round tower is still there, but that's not where we're excavating, No, we're excavating uh, in another area and I can only hope we're excavating on the right spot because some of these representations of 1790 show it to have been on a different spot. Well, why? I mean, if there was just one like that, you'd think, oh, well, it's artistic well, license. I, he just wanted to I, balance the I tree. I take your point but... that it's two against one. The two separate representations show it uh, as if it's in a different spot. But, I mean, is there a certain amount of artistic license shown in order to go and fill out that particular um, spot on the left-hand side of the picture? We don't know. The spot that we're digging in um, is based on the plan that I was telling you about earlier. But I still feel that Béranger, who was the artist of the, the plan, uh, that he's a very reliable draftsman, and I still uh, believe in what he did. <laughs> well, let's hope for Phil's sake we are digging in the right place. Back at base in the museum, the first year physics results are ready, and Sue can superimpose them on the tennis court area. But what do they show? We need John's expert eye to interpret them. Well, I've broken my glasses and it <laughs> should be clearer, but it's not. <laughs> um, the black, the high resistance, it, it could be rubble spread, demolition or, or whatever. It could just be geology. But what's of possible interest, if you can actually see these lines, mm. Mm. It, it could be that we've got the remains of buildings. One possibility is that this could be something to do with the Benedictine Abbey, the, the 12th century Abbey, rather than the than anything earlier, but I think we would expect that to be at right angles to the church, wouldn't yeah, we? I mean, it'd be very odd. Hold on, I'm getting terribly confused about dates. Is the Benedictine Abbey part of that? It Presumably is. tacked onto that. It's well, yeah. I mean, that's the Benedictine church fabric yeah. inside there. Yeah. And so, and if we dug down here and found a foundation, you would be able to know whether it was part of that Benedictine or whether it was from an earlier phase? It would very much depend on the nature of the artefacts that we found with the foundations, I think, you know, so that we could date them and possibly the character of the stonework itself. Well, it's worth a go to put a trench across that. So should we put something in? Uh, take... I'd have thought a, what, an 8 by 2 or a 10 by 2 or something yes. like that. Yeah. Okay. You can fix us something across the middle there then. Even yeah. without your glasses. Even without my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Yeah. The lens fell out, the printer broke down. I've got some little screws and, and not... And, oh, and can we for... get on? <laughs> As ever, time is the enemy. And the sooner we get trench number two underway, the sooner we'll find out exactly what's here. I'm just beginning to realise quite how complicated this site is. This church was started up about ten years ago and it was rebuilt in the 18th century. But the shell of it is this here, which was part of this... Benedictine monastery, we think, and by the side of it there was this 10th century bell tower, and in the 10th century it probably looked like that, and underneath that, hopefully, there was a wooden structure which was St Patrick's original church. Carenza to Stuart, over. Hello, Carenza Stuart here. Carenza and Stuart are looking for evidence of a boundary ditch in the fields around the hill. Yeah, that's right, Grenzer. I'm, I'm in the um, Island Lane East field at the moment. So you're down here, Stuart, just north of the cathedral. It's a slight feature showing quite well on the air photographs. Looks like part of an enclosure going round the cathedral. Does that show on the ground at all as a bank or a ditch or anything? Yeah, there's some terrific earthworks here, Carenza. There's a, a strong bank and a ditch outside it. It's sort of a nice dip on it. And it looks as if it's been filled in. Oh, that's fantastic, a bank and a ditch. That's more than we could have hoped for. Nick Brannan found remains of an early Christian ditch in an excavation carried out here in 1987. Could it be that Stuart and Carenza have spotted more of the same ditch continuing on the other side of the hill? Another element of an early Christian monastery was a high cross. Like this one, which currently stands at the back of the cathedral, 
and which Peter believes could date back as far as the 8th or 9th century. And what was their significance? Their significance was to go and tell the Bible story to those who weren't in the position of being able to read the Bible themselves, because we can only presume that most of the people looking at a cross like this would have been illiterate. So this is like, if you like, an early comic strip, an early film strip, and in each panel there is a, an illustration of a scene from the Bible. But when St Patrick arrived here five centuries earlier, he wouldn't immediately have hewn a stone cross, presumably. No, 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 no. I suspect, no. Uh, you can't prove it, but they would have probably staggered in with a rather light wooden cross, which they'd have plonked into a site probably already maybe sacred to the local inhabitants. Could be. And yep, used yep. that as a preaching focus. It's fairly you've both taken this down a bit, haven't you? We've when actually... I was here earlier, you just... You just found this feature and were thinking it might be the wall but was a bit narrow. Yeah, I'm afraid all that, uh, all <laughs> excitement. that excitement got, got the better of us. I'm pretty sure it's probably a drain. But what's this here in here? Well, this, looks, this, this, this really bigger. was this really was beginning to get a lot more exciting. When we took off the layers of the tarmac, we got this rather nice, what we think is a wall trench. It's about the right width, It's isn't exactly it? the right width for what we want. Three feet wide, they said, didn't they? Um, that's right. What's that in the bottom? Because is that part of the wall? These enormous slabs, absolutely enormous slabs. And underneath is, is there's voids. I, I have this sneaking suspicion that it, it may be well be drain. a drain. It's a rather fine drain, though. Yeah. So, no early Christian bell tower to go with this tune as yet. And the news from Trench 2 isn't too good either. Still no sign of building remains of any period to match the geophys signals detected here. But apparently, we now have another trench. Meg? Yeah? What's going on? This is very untimed, team. We sit around, we discuss a strategy, and then finally, we dig a trench. Yeah, well, we thought we wouldn't tell anybody. We've just been hiding down here and getting on with it. This is Stuart's <laughs> doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, Stuart's behind it. <laughs> Stuart couldn't wait. He wants to know if this bank and ditch belongs to the early Christian period or the later medieval Benedictine monastery which occupied this hill. Sorting out these two periods is clearly going to be one of our biggest challenges this weekend. I think we've got an enclosure which really just follows the contour all the way around the hill and defines the hill top as, a, as, a, as an important area, whatever the area is. I'll leave them to it. I want to talk to John about the geophys results from Trench 2. John, it's hard to believe that you could dig such a big trench so near to an old church and find so little, isn't it? It does seem odd. Um, I mean, I wasn't convinced by the results this morning, as you know, and it suggests it's been all levelled, bulldozed away when they built the tennis courts. So there might have been some interesting stuff here, and it's just yeah, off I in a heap I think the changes I was getting were geological. So Trench 2's closing down. But what's the story now with Trench 1? I was going to ask if you found the foundations to the tower, but by the look on your faces, <laughs> that question's pretty redundant, isn't it? <laughs> well, a... no, we haven't got it, Tony, I'm afraid. Um, well, I say I'm not afraid at all. I think we've got a very nice stone drain. That it's 18th century and it's only a drain. So we've got no clue, so I think we're going to have to admit we can't find it. After digging one trench, look, Peter said how significant this thing is. We've just <laughs> drawn one circle. Yeah. Surely we, 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 there's another shot we can do. But tell. we've only got one set of measurements. I mean, those measurements we would have sworn were accurate. We've put our, our trench in on the basis of that. We've got no other measurements to go on. And we don't really believe the artist who drew this uh, wasn't trying to make a nice view out of it, so he's actually moved the tower across. Well, that's just because you think of yourself as a scientist. Well, it's, like it it's, it's because <laughs> that's what they did in the 18th century when they did drawings. Well, Peter, are you prepared to let go of it? Uh, the only thing I would say is, would it not be worthwhile doing a little bit more of that trench there, just to see if by any chance we might be missing that is, something that is, that is exactly it. I mean, mm. there is scope for it to be underneath there, and so. we've definitely mm. got to go for mm. that in the morning. I think yeah. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mick, what else are we going to do tomorrow? Well, we've started one of the trenches on the boundary around there, uh, and when John's processed his geophys from the, the field next door, we'll probably put another one in there. I mean, it, it's looking very much as if the top of the hill has been severely modified, but round the edge, round the periphery of the site, it probably is still well preserved. And so we'll go for at least two areas there and uh, think about it again then. And if we're looking for a settlement, we may actually find the limits of it, the enclosure around it, rather yeah. than the middle. That's our yeah. best yeah. bet, I think. Banks and ditches. 
Okay, so that's the end of day one. I don't think we've ever found quite so little <laughs> <laughs> on our first day, but remember what time team's like. If you found nothing today, way. we'll find the world tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Consider ourselves lucky. We even found the drain, to be quite honest. <laughs> but he always says that at the end of day one. Doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's clear his neck for him, I really do. <laughs> It's the beginning of day two and we've been having absolutely no luck whatsoever over by the church which was where we hoped to find the foundations of this tower because it looks as though later building has obliterated any evidence of it. But Stuart now thinks that he's found a ditch which could be the ditch round the early Christian settlement, either that one there or maybe one round there. Geophysics have been working in the next field along. Have they found any trace of the ditch continuing there? This is the magnetic results, Tony. So we've got the church behind us, uh, and we're stood in the field uh, about here. You can see a series of stripes. That's the ridge and furrow ploughing. That's medieval. We can ignore that. But what's of interest are these two strong curving anomalies, which look to be like the boundary ditches. So we've got two ditches in this field, but which one lines up with Stuart's ditch in the next field along? Sort of the first one about here somewhere. I mean, roughly here. Yeah. A big anomaly curving across, and then the other one's going to be about 15, 15 metres down, something like that. So another arc coming through here. This is roughly where it is in the other field, but I can't tell you can't which one's see. the one that links up. What are we going to do? Well, what we've decided to do is investigate both of these features, both the outer one and the inner one. But to put one trench across, the whole way across both of them would mean 25 metres long, yeah. which is a bit big. <laughs> so what we're going to do is put an interrupted trench in, if you like, um, like a dashed line. So you can join it up later if you need exactly. to. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm getting caught up in the excitement about finding ditches, but I'm not really sure why. Why is it so important to know if there are ditches circling this hill? One of our problems with any site is to define the extent of it. Yeah. Unless you know how far the site goes in any direction, you've really no idea whether you're in the middle or one side or whatever. And we're assuming we're in the middle because we're up on the hill. Outside the cathedral, we've now checked the other end of Trench 1 and can find no sign of the early Christian bell tower. We do know that the uh, foundations of round towers were very often not very deep. They were sometimes only about, uh, you know, three feet deep. Oh, really? Yeah, so mm. it may be that in doing various works here, when the cathedral was being uh, restored between 1790 and 1818, it just took the whole lot away. But it takes a real man to know when to stop looking, doesn't That's it? That's right, yes. No, I, I think, uh, you know, with, with, with reluctance, but I, I say, yes, I think we'll give it up. <laughs> right. um, but uh, I still, as I say, I still feel that my, my original plan was correct. We can still show how we think the bell tower would have looked standing next to the medieval abbey around 1400 AD. Of course, the modern cathedral tower wasn't there then. There was a, an archway in the gable here, very similar to the one you see in the other view, the, the existing east window. So, right. of that sort of scale. About that yeah. Right. yeah. But clearly you weren't walking through that, mm -hmm. so I suspect what you're going to have to try and do is assume it's been infilled somehow with a more human-sized doorway in the middle right. here. Okay, Joe. One important activity carried out by the monks here in the early Christian and medieval periods would have been the making of parchment. Local man Joe McDonough is here to show Phil the main stages in making parchment from calfskin. So we cover it in with lime. Lime, yeah? Lime, yes. And we'll roll it up. Like this. Oh, this way, does it? Yeah. Now, what's the lime going to do? The lime will, will, will uh, kill off the hair off the, off the skin. So it's only on the hair side? Only on the hair side. We we'll right. roll, roll, roll it up like this. Yeah. And we'll uh, tie it with, with uh, twine. Yeah. And, and then how long is it going to stay like that? We'll put it into a, a piece of horse manure. Sorry? Into a piece of horse manure. Horse manure? Horse manure, yeah. The whole process would have taken several weeks, but obviously we haven't got time for that. This is the one that's been in the horse manure for three weeks, that's is right. it? That's it. So we'll leave it out. It's flat. Right. And now we'll, this, this should be, should be um, cured. So we'll take off the hair of it. Like this. No, it actually just, just pulls off, doesn't it? Yeah. Where would this have actually taken place? Here, we'll take it within the monastery walls. Within the monastery walls, oh, yeah? Well, why not? 
It's very smelly. It's that, that's smelly. all. That's why not. <laughs> <laughs> After removing all the hair and washing the lime off the skin, it's stretched as far as it'll go and then left on the frame for several days to dry out. When it's dry, the fat can be scraped off the other side of the skin more easily. Watching this is calligrapher Michael Gullick, who together with Victor is going to produce an illuminated page of manuscript for us this weekend. Some parchments would have been very carefully made from animals very carefully chosen for the very best books. If you were going to write a letter or an account, you'd use much cheaper, much less well-made parchment. I mean, you get quality in parchment as you get quality in anything else. Sure. It's really long-lasting stuff, wasn't it? Well, I mean, the, the, the really? delight is, of course, that they happened upon a material that is long-lasting, that will last literally for thousands of years, yeah. whereas if they'd discovered paper earlier, we wouldn't know nearly as much about the civilization of the time of our early monastery. Mm -hmm. And, of course, on that hill, there must have been parchment mm -hmm. makers who were churning this stuff out. Yeah. But I, I, we've certainly got a quote, for instance, in the 9th century of a bloke, and my, my, my Irish is hopeless, but Mokwarak Makin Sermon, who the Romans called the teacher of the world, committed to writing this knowledge on the island which is called Cranach Dwinleth Glass, which is the old name for Dan Patrick. So we know that at least by the 9th century they were doing this, and probably much, much earlier, yeah. probably back to the notional time of St Patrick. After finding very little yesterday, it's great to hear that Stuart's trench is beginning to turn up some nice finds. What's that? that? It's an arrowhead. It's an armour-piercing arrowhead. Can you see? There's the point. There's a little flange to... It's for penetrating chain mail, so it goes yeah. through a little hole. As it goes through, it forces the mail open and it can go straight into your body. And what sort of date do we reckon this is? Um, a, we reckon about 12th, 13th century at the moment. Well, that's just come out the top soil, so it's not stratified. We can't say exactly. It doesn't date anything. But it's a really rather nice, nice find, isn't it? Well, I love the idea of this place being under attack. And uh, what about the the, the colour well, that the, indicates where the ditch is? At the moment, we're still in a lot of topsoil here, which has come down off this slope. Yeah. Um, so we're still digging through that. But once you get over here, that's starting to look like the edge of a ditch. But we're still a long way to go down yet. Well, I'm going to have to be quick to keep up with the number of trenches today because while I've been here with Stuart, Mick's got Phil to open up another trench out here. What's this one all about? This one here is because uh, Nick did a small trench. Where was it, Nick? It was just down about six feet downslope from us. I did a very, very, very small trench through what is a clearly a depression in the ground. Not this weekend, sometime No, this was no, about ten time. years ago. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was a follow-up to excavations I'll be doing on the other side of the hill. Yeah. Just a little look, and we found uh, a rubber trench, and I'm convinced that what we've got here is some sort of medieval building, fine medieval building. You have got to be quick to keep up. The thinking is that there's another building on a platform across here and what looks like a road running between the two buildings. And you can see it best by coming somewhere through here. What you've actually got is a raised this is causeway. Like a raised road. Yeah. So, so this is one ditch on one yeah. side and then up here and for the road. it raises up. And down there. Yeah. So that would be a, a road of some stasis, presumably, yeah. not just But you can see track. under the trees, look, it's coming straight up the slope. Yeah. And it's heading through the hedge that way, and it's heading straight for the church. This clearly is not the sort of thing you bring stone up or supplies or anything like that, because you wouldn't get up that slope. Yeah. But it is the sort of thing that you might come in as a pilgrim or a visitor and come up the slope and face the, the church in front of you with buildings on each side, which could be... Guest houses, chapels, something like that. Such as three buildings, yeah. yeah. According to Mick, it'll all be much easier to see from the air. Now that's the trench there where Stuart first thought he saw the ditch, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, across the earthworks there. Then there's Island Lane. And then there's the interrupted trench. Yeah, that's the one across the good geophysics of the, the lines of the ditches coming round like this. But the earthwork doesn't really yeah, show does up look. here. Yeah, there, look. Oh, yeah, on, on your new yeah, trench. Yeah, because of the low sunlight look. Yeah. And you see the trench going up and down. You can see all the mounds across round it. There's loads of earthworks down there, but Mick's right. I can see the roadway, the building platform on the left, and the shape of the large building we're digging. From up here, it's also much easier to appreciate how this landscape is made up of a series of small hills.
imagine how impressive a monastery on this hill must have looked when it was completely surrounded by water, as we know it was in the early Christian period. Back to work, and Phil's making good progress in Trench 6, where he's now beginning to find evidence of the medieval building. All this collapse and tumble, you can see all these stones, they're all higgledy-piggledy. Yeah. It's obviously where the wall has tumbled. And then, most important, oh, look, yeah. I think yeah. we've got a mortar floor. Oh, yeah. Geophysics are getting good results in this area too. What I've found is two curving ditches here. As you did in the earlier field. As we did, but I've managed to look at them on the screen. What I need to do is go and plot the data out now and give me half an hour. But how are we getting on in Stuart's trench on the other side of the hill? Oh, this has come on a lot, hasn't it? Yeah, it's moved on a lot since, since earlier on. What, what we've got now is, is a ditch where yeah. we thought there was going to be one. There's a cut down there. Yeah. And there's a cut just, just over there. That bit hasn't been taken Let's out. Let's have a look. But it's now looking like a good ditch. It's a hell of a width, isn't it? Yeah, and it's got a bank on the outside of it there as well, Mick, which we just thought the stones had that stony in bit. Yeah. So we've actually now got a defined ditch where we thought it would be. We've had one or two finds come out of it, which are nothing that actually dates it yet, but there's a few bits over here worth looking at. Declan, there's a nice piece these, just to these are pieces that we've got. Can you just explain Yes, well, what we've got? most of the finds came from the topsoil. Yeah. Um, obviously, fine medieval pottery like this, a nice piece of uh, base. And we also find, bear in mind, the uh, arrowhead from right. the topsoil here as well. Yeah. But yeah. we are just after finding one piece of medieval pot actually from the fill of the ditch. Right. This is uh, probably locally made stuff. Again, you're probably dealing about 13th century. Right. So these would be fingerprints on the inside? Exactly. Yeah. So Not so much, it, it would have been made on a wheel, but it would have been smoothed out by hand. Yeah. The 13th century stuff in the top. Yes. That bodes quite well for it being considerably earlier lower down, doesn't it? <laughs> um, considering its depth, um, I don't want to commit myself. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we think this ditch would have been for? Well, the obvious thing to think is that it's defence because it's around the top of the hill. And in some cases, they did reuse earlier defensive sites when they put these uh, early Christian monasteries in. But it's much more likely that it's actually meant to be a, a sort of boundary. Uh, not a defence, but something that says outside this is the ordinary secular world, you know, the everyday world, and inside this is something special. It's a defined religious area, a sacred area perhaps. It's, it's much more that sort of boundary. Rather like a lot of prehistoric sites are like that. Mm. So given how big it is, do we think that it's most likely to have been the very outside? The, the, out, the outer one, I think, yeah. because yeah. below this, you see, it drops away mm -hmm. and it does all the way around the hill. It's the, only the flat top they're going to use. Inside the cathedral, a replica of the Book of Kells, which was written about 800 AD, is being closely studied, as it'll be the inspiration for our page of illuminated manuscript. The colours in Kells itself, like most uh, Irish books, is fairly limited. There are not, in fact, many colours. Yes. It's the way that they were used. One of the colours which is most striking is, in fact, the yellow, mm -hmm. which is a sort of substitute for gold. Before working on the actual parchment itself, Victor has to master the art of using a quill pen. Hold it in your right hand, just as you would normally. Now dip it into the ink, and then that's it, that's fine. Be fairly firm. That's oh, right. it. Right. What you're really doing is you've got this sort of puddle of liquid and you're, you're pushing, pushing it around. around on the surface of the paper. The colours are obtained from various minerals and Robin's job is to grind the rocks into fine powder while Michael mixes the egg white which will be used tomorrow to bind the colour together. But today isn't quite over yet, and the latest news is that an important find has just turned up in Stuart's trench. Stuart, what we have here is a piece of pottery, souterrain ware. You can see it's got a basal angle on it just there, mm -hmm. so we're dealing with the corner of the pot. And this is coil built, it's not wheel thrown. You can just see the sort of yeah. curvature of the coils. Mm -hmm. So that's diagnostically early Christian pottery, Very much so, exactly yeah. the sort of thing we've been looking for. Yeah, and it's coming from an early deposit, Declan tells us. So. Oh, that's marvellous, because that's what we wanted to establish with this trench, to see whether it confirmed your findings in the trench on the other side, that's right. and whether this enclosure is one big enclosure. Yeah. And this is as good as we're going to get, isn't it? That's, that's I'm very happy with it. Stuff, yeah. that. Great. 
So this bit of pot confirms that at least one of our ditches is early Christian in date. So what's going on? Well, we're trying to sort of put all the information together onto one map. We had a power failure here early, so earlier, so we're having to do it by hand. Yeah. But all the evidence we have got at the moment is pointing to the fact we've got two ditches going round the hilltop. But confusingly, at one point, the early Christian ditch is on the outside. And at another point, the early Christian material seems to be on the ditch in the inside. So what we really need to do is fill in the gaps, and then we can work out how these ditches join up and at what point they cross over. And do you think you can do that tomorrow? Do you mind sharing glasses? Well, <laughs> <laughs> with a bit of luck, more excavation in the trenches we've got and some more geophysics, John. Yes, and some um, more whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> to fill in the gaps, yes. There's hardly any of this left, I'm afraid. What are you lot doing? <laughs> oh, come on, this is unreal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Rearrange their outfits, put them back a few centuries. This is the contrast between the black Benedictine habit of, say, the 12th century and the early Christian monk in his rather sort of sackcloth here. Look at the earthworks there. <laughs> oh, thank you. What's all this? Well, this is, this is the, the bell, the hand bell that they, they would have taken up to the top of the bell tower. And he's got a missile or some sort of script. And he's following the rule of St. Benedict, which enables him to have... Religiously. Quite a nice <laughs> lifestyle. And I'm following the rule of St. Columban, which means that I have hell to pay all the time. What do they wear underneath me? Oh, so by the Benedictines, they certainly had linen vests and linen no, underpants. I told you, you know. this would be... hair knickers, surely. It's now become a conversation about underwear. Join us for day three, when hopefully we'll be able to pull all these little bits of information that we've got together and find out what early Christian life was like in this fantastic site. It's the beginning of day three. On day one, we started excavating here, looking for evidence of the early Christian tower. But pretty soon it became apparent that the whole central area round the church, way out to here beyond this hedge, had been flattened by some later building work and had obliterated any evidence that there might be of medieval or certainly of early Christian. So we shifted our focus to the periphery of the site, way beyond that hedgerow, and we found two ditches which appear to be intertwining, one of which we think is medieval and the other which we hope is early Christian. But we didn't give up on this whole area here. In fact, we've thrown more people into excavating than we ever have on any previous time team, I think. We've now got eight trenches going in various areas, and we appear to have hit gold in this flattened area where we thought there was nothing on the end of day one. Nick, what is it that's Sorry. so significant about this particular trench? Well, what we've got here, we think, is a surviving Benedictine wall line coming approximately north-south, one of the conventional buildings that we started off looking for. What's particularly interesting for me is the contrast between this medieval building foundation and this dark charcoal flecked soil that you can see over there and also in the section on this side. And this, I believe, to be the early Christian period uh, land horizon which predates the foundation of the Benedictine monastery. So we've got early Christian and medieval in one trench? Yes. Are we going to be able to pursue both or are we going to have to sacrifice one to get the other? Well, if this wall carries on at that height, we can chase it quite conveniently in that direction and I would hope that we can extend the trench in this direction to focus on the early Christian period land. Brilliant. Well, this is a bit of luck, because the small test pits put in here were positioned randomly just to check the Geophys black signal showing here. Some of it's just rubble, but clearly not all of it. So we'll have to get moving if we're going to accomplish all our goals today. In the outer fields, our goal, of course, is to find out where the double ditches go exactly and how they join up. Geophys, we hope, will resolve this if they can fill in all the gaps in their survey. At Carenza's interrupted trench, the dig for dating evidence for the boundary ditches has been slowed down by the discovery of another drain. Our problem is this drain, but we're bypassing right, that. Right, drains that thing with the slates down the yeah, side of yeah, that. Uh, but there is some compensation in the form of nice finds. Gosh, that's, that's really interesting beautiful, stuff. isn't it? Yeah. Is that a roof tile? Yeah. Lovely, look at that. And that presumably is, is another piece yeah, of it. It would have made a, a big tile like that. The same sort of mm -hmm. situations. Damn it. That would look beautiful on a building, yes. wouldn't it? I mean, that's a high status building, isn't it? It is. You wouldn't it get is. that. It's, it's come out of the drain. It's come it? out of the drain. Yeah, there's, there's more of it coming out as well. We, oh, we, we've goodness. got quite yes, a lot of, um, this, uh... of tile. It looks like medieval roof slates and tiles have been used in the building of the drain. 
That's amazing. Well, it's coming up freaking fast, yeah. isn't it? Meanwhile, inside the cathedral, our two scribes are also working against the clock. And having traced off their design, they've now started work on the parchment itself. It's a wonderfully smooth surface, this. It's difficult to imagine that this is the same material uh, that we saw you and Joe producing. Oh, no, what Joe was making was very crude parchment. This is very sophisticated parchment. This would have taken much longer to mm -hmm. make. I find it fascinating that you can see this, this kind of random pattern of, of the natural surface of the animal. Uh, well, yes. On it. These are the veins, which uh, makes the surface texture. Hello, Tony. Hello, Mac. Time to check on Phil's progress with the medieval building in Trench 6. We've taken away all the rubble, and you can see that we've got quite a nice little patch of floor. And that is quite a nice, solid, yeah. laid floor. That's the bit we could just see in the section That's the bit we could yeah. just see in the section yesterday. Yeah. And in the rubble, we've got more of the slate roofs, so we know oh, yeah. what the, the yeah. roof looked like. And what do you think of this, then? Look at that dressed oh, yeah. ashlar block. Yeah. And you can see the tool marks on it. If you get the, the light right, look. You see that? Yeah. yeah they've, they've, they've prepared it. That's presumably something to do with the, the medieval buildings of the Abbey. Undoubtedly, yeah. Mm. But look at this, too. Mm. I can show you this bit out of the bag. Lead. Yeah. Ah, look. You see, it's two bits two squashed bits. together. So, in fact, it has had the gap for the glass to go down. Right. That's very good, isn't but it? But look at this. Look what else we got. Now, that I'm not going to take out of the bag. Ah, yes. But that yeah. is the window glass. Right. I mean, so, all is... those colours aren't No, paint, that's or... all part of the decay, the yeah. laminations. I mean, that is pretty typical of, of early glass. Yeah. It just falls to bits. And you get these coloured patination, don't you, when it's in yeah. the ground and it sort of rots. And... But, I mean, the main thing is, it's a very, very high-status building. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, there's yeah. no monkeying about with that. Yeah. And everything's still in the case we're talking about medieval. Yeah, most definitely. So we, we ought to stop with this and, and really concentrate. There's, there's no, back there's in the middle, nothing really more we can, yeah. we can add to it. So now, on the, uh, on the far end of this trench, we'd been hoping that you'd be able to confirm for us that that was a road with a ditch on either side. Yeah, I mean, Nick and Stuart have both deliberated on that long and hard, and they're, they're really both happy that it's a very early road. So this trench has done its job. And we can now picture this high-status building, which we think was probably a guest house situated alongside one of the roads leading into the Benedictine Monastery. Phil's next job is to help extend the test pit in the tennis court area, where we think we found more remains of the Benedictine Abbey. While at the museum, Carenza is delighted to see that geophysics have sorted out the route of the ditches around the hill. So that will overlap with what we'd done yesterday. So that's... That fits there. Right. And so, so we've now got the ditch running from the lane in the north all the way around to Nick's Trench that's in the wonderful. south. Uh, and then the outer ditch, some 15, 20 metres away in parts, coming up here. Mm. And it, it continues around on the outside, back up to that point. So we've got two concentric ditches. But do both ditches date to the same period? Time to get a progress report from Stuart. Are you in Trench 3, Stuart? Yes, I am, Tony. That's Trench 3, that one there. What have you got as far as ditches is concerned? Well, we've got an absolute belter of a trench here, Tony. We've, we've actually found two early Christian ditches, a widish one and then a narrow one outside it. We've got datable early Christian pottery from the inner one. So two ditches and they're both early Christian, nothing medieval? Yeah, we've got two early Christian ditches, but the, out the outside one was recut in the medieval period. OK, thanks. Carenza, is John with you? Yes, he is. Hello, Tony, it's John, listening over. What are your plans now, as far as geophysics are concerned, John? Well, if I had my way, I'd be going home. <laughs> For a rest, but uh, there's a 20 metre gap. Between Stuart's Trench and where I've surveyed, and we need to just finish off that area. By dating and mapping the boundary ditches, we're beginning to get an understanding of just how big the monastery was during the early Christian period. But how are we doing in the tennis court area? What's the current thinking about what we've discovered there? I've been racking my brains, Nick, to think what this structure could be. Same here. 
And all I can come up with is it, because you've got mortar in it, it's presumably part of the Benedictine Abbey. Yeah. Uh, and then, so I'm thinking, well, what the hell could it be in, in, in a Benedictine Abbey? And it depends a bit on where we are in relation to the church. Yeah. I'm thinking that it might be in the West Range. So the cloisters are over here and the West yeah. Range over here. Yeah. But, I mean, I've been to hundreds of monastic sites and, and the only thing I can think of is it looks like the bottom of the latrines or the guard road shafts coming down from above and then going off a slope like that. But it doesn't feel a very it doesn't feel a <laughs> satisfactory <laughs> explanation, <laughs> really. Let's go and have some lunch. Hang right. on, not so fast. <laughs> Come and have a look at this before you go. What's that then, Phil? Well, <laughs> look at this down here. I don't know what it is, but look at that. Look at this. It's got really, really black down in there. It's got really firm too. And that's diving away. Look, did you see it? Yep. We've had that black horizon behind yeah. you, mind you. It's, it, I think it's, it's running through fairly consistently. I Earlier on thought that might be the pre-building surface, but, you know, in the light of what we've been yeah. discussing, it could yeah. be, you know, contaminated soils coming down, say, from a latrine chute. Victor and Michael are quietly making progress and enjoying the fact that they're repeating a process that went on here for hundreds of years, until it finally came to an end with the dissolution. In England, I suppose we're used to Henry VIII dissolving the monasteries. Right. And of course the same thing happened in Ireland because the English ruled over here, of course. Uh, but it was a process over here that went on a lot longer. In fact, they were still right. dissolving abbeys in, in Ireland in, uh, at the end of Queen Elizabeth I's reign in 1603. Yeah. But uh, no, Dan Patrick was one of the early ones to go. And as far as we can tell, uh, 1541 was when it finished. And of course, at that moment in time, it would become a quarry for stone for the whole area. But as we've discovered this weekend, they didn't take all of the stone. They left some of it behind. But what exactly? Is there still time to find out? This is odd, this bit, isn't it? I don't understand that at all. Um, we've got... Yeah, there's... It looks awfully like mortar underneath there. This yeah. is actually sitting on... Ah, on that's more that sitting, slope. Sitting on that slope. That slope runs in underneath. This is sitting on the top of it. I don't know what it does on that side. It, it's... But there's mortar there, isn't it? It, it, looks, it, looks, it looks far more convincing on that side. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice on that side. What you've got is you've got the guys are building this wall. They've built this slope here. When they've built that slope there, they then put this, this, uh, this block of wall in on top of that sloping uh, ramp. And then this ramp's been built after that and keyed into it. The builders are actually working towards me. So we've got a little snapshot of a little period of time during which this wall was built. Well, time's almost up, but it looks like the illuminated manuscript will be ready by the end of the day. We started the weekend expecting to encounter several layers of history and we weren't disappointed. Our earliest finds were these bits of early Christian souterrain ware, which date back to 800 AD. One piece in particular came from a cooking pot, which Sue has reconstructed. When we say early Christian, we can't take that back as far as St Patrick. No, because rather like in parts of England, there is no pottery in the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries. So we can't say it's a disappointment not to have anything No, because Patrick, we'd, be, so. we'd have a job to recognise activity from pottery. It's yeah. one of the big dilemmas of archaeology you now. How do you recognise the Dark Ages yeah. when there's no pottery? Our big success story was tracing the double ditches around the hill. And geophysics have just one last bit of the circle to reveal. I <laughs> just cut this out. Dead high tech, isn't it? Uh, Boy Scouts. <laughs> OK, here we go. That's close as I, I can get it. You can yeah. see we've got the one ditch coming through on the same alignment, oh, yeah. Yeah. but this outer ditch, ah. look what it does there. That's exactly where the earthwork ditch ends, and, and there had to be a reason for that. And there's a slight causeway visible in the earthworks, and I was suspicious this might be an entrance. And the way this bows out will create an intern for an entrance coming up the slope into the enclosure, an early Christian entrance to the site. Presumably that's where, the, where that line of nettles stops to. That's it, it's, it's the gap between the nettles and the hedge defining island lane itself. 
So although we haven't found evidence of a church like this, which dates back to St. Patrick in the 5th century, we have found the early Christian boundary ditches, which established the size of the monastery which developed over the next few hundred years, and looked something like this in the 10th century. At least one of the ditches was reused by the Benedictine monastery founded in the 12th century. And Carenza's long interrupted trench produced the additional information that this field was used as an industrial area during the medieval period. We found this uh, probable kiln. Brilliant, Brilliant, isn't it? It's very red, isn't it? I mean, I've been chasing ditches all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and at last, something really yeah. nice from the geophysics point of view. And we've got several other within this area. We've just selected one. Right. So there's definitely industrial mm -hmm. working going on. But as Mick's explaining to the bishop, it was this area in the tennis courts which kept us all guessing today. 6.32, day three. Reluctantly, it's time to pack up. Phil... Do we reckon we've solved the problem of this trench? I reckon we finally cracked it, Tony. What we've actually got are two rubbish chutes that are emptying from a, a kitchen into these two vast pits, and they're full up with an amazing array of, of bone, animal bones, we've got fish bones, we've got bird bones. So they're obviously living on an incredibly rich diet. I mean, <laughs> they weren't starving, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> and that fits with a historical reference I found in 1617 to a hall and a kitchen in the cloister on the north side of the church. Yeah, perfect. Steve's 3D computer graphic gives us one interpretation of how this building could have looked, complete with working rubbish chutes. Nick, did we get out of it what you hoped for? Yes, and more so, in fact. I think the geophysics has been brilliant. And it's really nice to see medieval remains still surviving in this area. It's fantastic. Well, it just remains for us to have a look at this illuminated parchment, oh. then. Exactly. Uh, the last manuscript produced in the Abbey, still fresh from the paint. Bishop, do you want to start commissioning? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to see it? Yeah, yeah. come on. <laughs> wow, hey, look at that. That's That's some that. business, eh? It's fantastic, isn't it? What does it say, Tony? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it says the, the coming of a host of the followers of time to Dan Patrick, where they made great discoveries. <laughs> and who do we think this is supposed to be? <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you.